Now, fruit is delicious, first of all, but uh, really the word fruit, when we think of fruit of the Spirit, we kind of think of apples and oranges and things like that. But instead of thinking the word, the, the, the idea of fruit, I want you to think of the idea of harvest, okay? Something that you harvest. If you were to use the word fruit in the first century, you would think, well, what does it produce, okay? So when we talk about the fruit of the Spirit, we're going to ask the question, what is the Spirit producing in you, And today, we're going to be talking about the first two listed in Galatians chapter 5. So if you have your Bibles, you can turn there. Um, We're going to be talking about the first two that he lists. And it's going to start with love, and then it's going to go on to joy. And I can't think of a better image of love and joy than my little son, Knox. He just turned one in March, and he is so excited. For those of you who had young kids, maybe your kids are older and you forgot. But aren't aren't young kids, don't they have so much excitement and joy in life? I mean, Knox gets excited about the smallest thing. One of his favorite things to do is to take something he's not supposed to take and jump into the room that I'm in. He's like, ha, just like that. I mean, we have these little nightlights that we put in. He knows he's not allowed to have them, but he will grab it. And I'm not even kidding you. Like, I'm actually going to go back here to show you what it's like. It's like the Kool-Aid man. He comes out, he goes, ha, 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 that's literally what he does. Well, last night, he had the most beautiful expression of love and joy on his face. Angel and I, we were um, out in the living room, and the kids' bedrooms are back down the hall. We're talking, we're standing at the countertop, and here comes Knox. He's got something in his hand, and he's waving it around like a helicopter, and he comes right up to me, ha, 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 and I look. And all of a sudden, my joy and my love turned into desperate fear. He had found his way into his sister's bedroom and opened up the diaper pail. (laughs) And he is just as excited as you could ever imagine a little kid being excited. And so I'm like, oh no, right? And he's just got this big smile on his face. He's joyful. He's happy. Uh, He's full of love. And I am full of fear. And so I immediately go after him. I knock it out of his hands and I grab him up. But of course, he stinks. I mean, he's really bad. So I'm taking him, you know, to his bedroom. And along the way, I'm like, we don't have chocolate ice cream. Yeah. Yeah. So there I am, and I'm like, Angel! Of course, we're freaking out, you know, because he stinks, he's dirty, gonna have to give him a bath. There's chocolate ice cream all over the floor. It is just an absolute mess. And then I start thinking about, well, I only only have one child. I've got two children. And so I'm like, Angel, you gotta get this cleaned up before Piper. And as soon as I said my daughter's Piper's name, I hear her slipping and falling in the chocolate ice cream. It's like worst case scenario, okay, folks? So that's how my day was yesterday, and it was an absolute nightmare. But despite that, right, when we're in difficult situations as parents, that's really kind of like a microcosm of life. Life is a mess, and we do things, and we say things, and things are done to us. And really, the question that we have to ask ourselves is simply this. When nothing is going right, how can I be expected to live? When I have to be around somebody I don't like, or do a job that I don't like, or things go wrong for me, or I mess up and I make mistakes, if God's spirit lives inside of me and I am a Christian, what kind of fruit am I producing in this tree? If you turn to Galatians chapter 5, Paul was dealing with a church who's struggling with a grace issue. They thought this, God's grace got you saved, but what you did kept you saved. And so they struggled with the doctrine of Galatianism. And they wanted to turn back to the old law in several ways. And so they wanted to have Christians get circumcised because that's what Jewish Christians did. And Paul made this very clear in Galatians chapter 5 and the first few scriptures. He says this in verses 1 through 4. If you make circumcision a requirement, you have fallen from grace. If you want to turn away from grace and back to the law meaning circumcision is the path to salvation and not grace, you have ostracized yourself from God's grace. And so by appealing to the law, you can break yourself off from God is what he teaches. But then there's another error that could possibly be made. And that's, well, if I'm a Christian and I'm free and I can do whatever I want to do, we run the risk of using our liberty in such a way that we fall away from Christ on the other side. Because yes, we have the liberty to do certain things, but sometimes our liberty causes more harm than good. 
It damages people around us. And so we have to have this balance. Should we appeal to the law as a basis of our justification and salvation? No. Are we free to just go do whatever we want to do? No. There's certainly a balance that's at work. And that's what Paul is trying to teach in the book of Galatians. And so he is instructing us simply this. And this is where I'd like for you to read along with me. It's one of my favorite verses in the New Testament. I memorized it when I was a young man. And it is a key to Christian living. Here's what Paul says in Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16 and 17. He says this. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. Here's the problem. We all have things that we want to do that we know we shouldn't do. And we all have things that we know we should do, but we don't necessarily want to do. How do we answer the riddle? How do we deal with the problem of, I know I should be serving and doing things that God wants me to do, but I don't feel like doing it. Have you ever felt like that before? But on the other hand, there are things that our flesh craves and we want and we desire, but we know we shouldn't do them. And if you're anything like me, nine times out of ten, you're doing the things that you want to do of the flesh rather than the things you should be doing of the spirit. Because we have a sinful nature. We are corrupted. And the point of being a Christian is to reverse the corruption and the curse and follow after God. So here's the answer. You ready? It was in Galatians 5.16. If I'm busy doing spiritual things, I won't be doing sinful things. If I'm busy doing spiritual things, I won't be doing sinful things. And so that's what he says in Galatians 5.16. So I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. You want to overcome the sin in your life? Paul says, get busy following after God. And one of the ways that we do that is we allow the Spirit to work in our life through what's called the fruit of the Spirit. Now, notice I didn't say fruits of the Spirit in the plural. I said fruit of the Spirit. If you look at this graphic up on the screen, this is pretty creative. You've got nine different flavors, right? Nine different aspects to the fruit of the Spirit, but it's still one brand. That's the same thing it is with the Holy Spirit. Some of us like to say, well, I'm not a loving person, but I'm gentle and I'm kind. Or maybe I really don't have patience or peace, but I can love and I can be faithful. Oh, no, 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 no. When the Holy Spirit is working in your life, when you've listened to the words of life and you've applied them to your life and you've been baptized into Christ, these things should be coming through you. We don't get to pick and choose. And so over the next month, as we look at these subjects, my prayer and my encouragement is that God would work through you in such a way that you would carry out all nine. And here's what's cool. It's your choice. It is your choice as to whether or not you're going to let God work through you. So let's start, right? Let's read Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, and let's look at what Paul has to say. What is the fruit of the Spirit? What should be harvested in our spirit and in our life? What is the outcome that this person is producing? And here's what Paul says. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, and against these things, There is no law. And so let's look at the first one. The fruit of the Spirit is love. You know, love, and I think that we would all agree, is a word that is heavily abused in our culture. We use the word love for pretty much anything that we like or anything that satisfies us. Is there a TV show? I love that TV show. Is there a person? I love that person. Is there a sports team? I love the Dallas Cowboys. I mean, we say things like that. Yes, amen. We say things like that all the time. We have abused the word love. So when we're watching football and we say, I love that, and then we turn to our husband or our wife and we say, I love you, what kind of message really are we sending to the people around us? And so no wonder our culture is corrupted with the idea of love. Now love is just a thing that you like or some type of infatuation. But that's not what the Bible teaches about love. The kind of love that should be flowing through us is what's called agape love. It is a love that seeks the highest good in others. So when you think about how you love people, whether it's the people around you in these pews or your family, or even the Bible says your enemy, 
We are to go through life thinking what benefits them the most. What is the greatest good? What is the highest quality of good that I can give them through the decision that I'm getting ready to make? It is a love that is chosen by the will of the lover. And so I think that's one of the things that's messed us up in our culture is we think that love is an emotional feeling. And if we don't feel love for somebody in our heart, then we're not gonna show it, right? I mean, we'll give them the attitude, the fifth degree, we'll treat them how they deserve, and there's gonna be no love in our heart for the people around us because after all, love is based on how we feel. But the Bible says love is based on a choice. It's on a choice of the lover. When the Bible says that God demonstrated his love for us, it doesn't necessarily mean that God feels affection for us, although that's what he does. God demonstrates his love for us because it's an action. It is a choice. And so if the Holy Spirit is going to flow through you and I, if we are going to let God have his way with us, if we are going to love people to the point that it's going to benefit them the most, we have to make the choice to love them. It's not based on our feeling or what we think. And it's also not based on the loveliness of the one loved. I mean, think about yourself, for example. Think about the things that you have done to God, to the people around you, the mistakes that you've made. I mean, the things that nobody knows about, what happens behind closed doors, maybe even the things that happen in your mind that nobody knows, not even your spouse or your kids or your parents. I mean, really, when you step back and look at yourself, and I know this is true for me, I'm like, wow, what a messed up individual. (laughs) Anybody else ever feel that way? Because it's true, but yet God made the choice to love you. Or look to Jesus. People with leprosy, diseases, people who were the worst sinners in the culture, and yet Jesus made the choice to not just act in love towards them, but to ultimately die on the cross for them. The worst of us, Jesus chose to love. And so if we're going to let God work through us, we have to choose to love This kind of love is the kind of love that is freely given without counting the cost or calculating your own profit. When we choose to let God use us and we choose to let God love through us, we're not saying, what is in it for me? I'm gonna love my wife so that I can get sex or I'm gonna give my my husband sex so that I can get love from him and he'll do things for me that I want him to do. I mean, we make exchanges all the time, but love isn't transactional. It's not, I'm going to love this person so that I can look good in the eyes of everybody else. It's, I'm going to love this person because that's what love is. That's what Christians do. And so it's not a transactional thing. It goes even deeper than our emotions. It lasts longer than attractiveness. Love is not something that you're attracted to. When people make the choice to get married, they are making a choice to love the other person even if they get ugly. (laughs) And that's good news for me. (laughs) We signed a covenant and a contract. There's no getting out of this one, baby. (laughs) You signed, sealed, and delivered. You're mine forever. Uh, So love is a choice. It goes deeper than emotions. It lasts longer than attractiveness. And it reaches wider than your bloodline. You know, we used to have this feeling, you know, back home in Ohio where, you know, blood was thicker than water. And if you were family, that meant more than anything. And that you were to love the person because after all, they're your own flesh and blood. Well, that's not necessarily true when it comes to the Bible. In fact, Jesus says, your love for me and other people may cost you your closest relationships. Because love is a choice. You know, when I think of it like this, the rubber of Christianity meets the road when we come to the intersection of being wronged and when nothing goes right. This is when the harvest of the Spirit truly becomes known. It's when your son gets into something that he's not supposed to get in and it is a terrible circumstance. Are you going to yell and scream and point the finger and blame everyone else? Or are you going to choose to love in the best interest of the other people? It's when we're standing in a line And we're waiting for an obnoxious amount of time. You're like, it's been seven minutes since I ordered my fast food at the drive-thru and I still don't have it. (laughs) Think about our culture. We do that, don't we? I've been waiting in Chick-fil-A for 10 minutes. What's wrong? Even though that's probably a blasphemous lie. But you get the point. (laughs) Chick-fil-A is awesome. Hey, here's a secret. I probably shouldn't tell you the secret, but outside lane. Okay, don't ever choose the inside lane at Chick-fil-A. It's always slower. I don't care how many cars are in the inside lane. Always choose the outside lane. Just a little blessing to you this morning, okay? But, (laughs) that's so stupid. It's true, though. 
So when we're standing and we're waiting in line and we, we are so used to getting everything right now and you can tell a lot about a person when you watch them in line and you wait and you wait and they're paying by check and you're like, what are you doing? Get a credit card, it's the 21st century. You gotta run the check through. We know that the rubber of Christianity meets the road when we feel unappreciated and unloved by our spouse and we want to react. Oh, if they're not gonna love me, well then I'm not gonna love them. If they're going to hurt me, well, then I'm going to hurt them. What kind of person are you? Do you have the fruit of love in your life? It's when our church takes actions and liberty that maybe we disagree with. You know, maybe there are things that Severn does that you necessarily don't like. How you respond and react to that says a lot more about you than it does about the decision that's being made. It's when our church decides that we are going to love people no matter what. How do you respond to when the church decides to love people no matter what? It's when our children make mistakes and they don't live up to our expectations. It's when we experience setbacks and the rude realities from those around us. That's when we know, are we exercising the fruit of love? Are we making the choice to love as God has loved us? And so here's the question. Have you demonstrated the fruit of the Spirit and acting in the best interest of those around you, even when you get disappointed and let down? Can you smile at the setbacks? When everyone else is cursing, are you cool? Are you love? Are you acting in the best interest of the people around you? You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter five, verse five, that God has poured out his love into our hearts, that he has loved us sacrificially, unconditionally, that he has given us so much more than we deserve. And if he has poured that kind of love out into our hearts, what kind of love should we be pouring into the lives of the people around us? And so what we get from God is what we should be giving to other people, right? And what kind of person are we if God extends his love and grace to us and we don't extend that same type of love to the people around us? I say there's something wrong with the tree. Maybe you aren't choosing to let God work through you the way that you let him work in you. And so when we look at this idea of love, we know that it comes from God. He pours it into our hearts. And you know the thing about Christian love is it really is incomprehensible. I mean, when you look at a man who's willing to die on a cross for the worst of us, that doesn't, that doesn't resonate with us. That doesn't make sense. Everything in our being says no, that isn't right. And even when I look at myself and I experience God's love and grace, even in my own life, I'm like, how could God possibly love me after all that I've done? I've disappointed him a thousand times over. I've sinned against him. Even when I promise God I won't do it again, and a day later I do the exact same thing, how could God love a person like me? It surpasses our understanding. Paul had this to say in Ephesians chapter 3. He says, that we as Christians should know God, that out of the riches of his glory, he may strengthen you with the power through his spirit in your inner being. That God may strengthen you, how? Through his spirit in your inner being. And look at this, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Then you, being rooted and grounded in love, will have power together with all the saints to comprehend the length and the width and the height and the depth of his love. And to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. See, God doesn't want us just to know his love. He wants us to experience his love. And the only way that we can experience his love is through his spirit. Well, last couple weeks we talked about how we get the life that God died for on the cross. Faith, repentance, baptism, good works. If you haven't done those things and you haven't experienced God's love, Why not? What are you waiting for? Don't you want to understand and not just know it with your mind, but feel it with your heart? I mean, there is something that feeling God's love radically changes your perspective of life. How can you possibly treat others with harshness and bitterness and anger and animosity when you've been forgiven by God? I don't know how I stomach myself to do it sometimes, but I do because I'm a sinner. But what are we striving for? What are we choosing? Sometimes we react emotionally, but part of the Christian life is putting those emotions in perspective and making the choice to love despite how we feel. Because God hated our sin, but he demonstrated his love for us. 
And so when we look at the fruit of the spirit of love, it is a choice that we make for the best interests of those around us. And that's what I want to encourage you to do this morning. Let God's spirit work through you and choose love. You know, our love should produce love for one another. And if we are truly led by the Spirit of God, we will love the people around us. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 that we are commanded to walk in love. Think about the imagery with with walking. I I think about Knox. Here he is carrying what he shouldn't have, just full of love and joy. And he's making the choice. He's excited about life. Even though he's not supposed to be doing what he should, you know, what he's not supposed to have what he should have, he makes the choice to laugh and giggle. I love his little teeth. He's got four little teeth that are poking through. They're all spaced out. He's got two little button teeth at the bottom. And I just tickle him all day. It's probably kind of jacking him up now that I think about it. But I tickle him all day so that I can see the joy on his face. And that brings me so much joy. What brings you joy? Man, I love coffee in the morning. First thing I do when I wake up, it just brings me so much joy. I have an espresso. We upgraded from real coffee to, it's, it's an espresso drink, and it's amazing. I'm, there, I'm standing there, I'm all excited because it's foaming and it's coming out and it's delicious and I've got my cream, and that brings me so much joy. I love to watch the Dallas Cowboys, right? Use the word love in our culture. I mean, it brings me so much joy. I, I like watching the Dallas Cowboys almost more than I like watching the Redskins lose, right? And that says a lot. I know, I know. Keep your rocks in your pockets for now. Man, I really enjoy, there are some things that bring me so much joy. I really enjoy spending time with Angel, talking over coffee, going out to a movie, grabbing a bite to eat. Those things are fun. We went to Sandy Point Beach just a few days ago, and uh, we took the kids, and it was a complete disaster. But uh, I, I, I really do, it does bring me joy going to the beach. But man, kids are exhausting at the beach. You're not only worried about like if they're going to drown, but I mean, they're just, one's going one way, the other's going the other way, and you have absolutely no peace. <laughs> so not doing that again, unless I get somebody to watch the kids. But there are, there are things that bring me joy in life. I like to study the Bible. It's fun. I like to listen to sermons. I like to go out in the community and help other people. These are things that bring me joy, and it's rooted in love. And so even though we're going to move on to joy here in a moment, why do you think Paul listed love at first? It's the foundation of everything else. You can't have joy or peace or patience or kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. You can't have any of the other flavors if you don't have love. And so that's where it all starts. What brings you joy? What makes you happy? Is it rooted in love? I like what Peter had to say in 1 Peter 1, He says, now that you have purified yourself by, by obeying the truth, right? You've been baptized into Christ. You've repented of your sin. He says, by obeying the truth so that you have sincere love for each other, love one another deeply from the heart. Deeply from the heart. You start with action and it'll move to emotion. Does your marriage stink? Do you find yourself not being able to stand the person in the other room? You're like, man, I love you, but I don't like you. What about the people around you in this church, your peers at school? Do you struggle finding love for people that you're around at work or wherever? Well, even though you might not feel it, love is a choice. It is an action. But when we get to the church, Paul escalates it, or Peter escalates it. He says, may you love one another deeply from the heart. Here's what that means. Love is not cold and it's not formal. Love is free from worldly passions and selfish ambitions. Love is free from deceitful intentions. It is free from hypocrisy. True love springs from the heart, saturated with God's truth. And so while we could love people, it could be because we're being selfish and because we're being dishonest and because we're being a hypocrite. And that's not true love. The kind of love that we should have is one that starts with choice and it leads to emotion. And that's why John said this. He says, if you're a Christian, If anyone has earthly possession and sees his brother in need, but withholds his compassion from him, how can the love of God abide in him? Little children, let us love not in word and speech, but in action and in truth. Don't tell me you love me, God says. I want you to show me. If the spirit of God really lives in you, you will love the people around you and it will be your choice. And you will have the power to do that. Because God's spirit lives in you. And that's what the Holy Spirit does. He makes us holy. 
He helps us love people, even though they seem unlovable. And so one day you might actually love my preaching if you stick around long enough. (laughs) But love is the foundation. And so when we ask the question, how do I feel about this person? Get rid of that question. What we should say is what kind of love should I demonstrate to have for this person? You know, uh, my wife got me a gift this last uh, month. It was awesome. Haven't had one for a while. It was a bathrobe, and I love it. A bathrobe is pointless. I, I'm like, I'm going to the grocery store in my bathrobe. And he was like, no, you're not. <laughs> you know, if I'm going to really fulfill this whole idea of being dad, I need to get two things. I need to get a bomber hat. Yes, thank you. Amen. And I need to get some boots, some duck boots, right, about mid-shin. And so I will be officially like total dad mode. I got a dad car, by the way. I traded, uh, sold my truck um, a few months ago, and I got a little Volkswagen dad car. You know, it's got a hatch in the back, and I'm like, man, I am full throttle dad. I cannot wait to take my kids to school in my bathrobe, in my bomber hat, in my boots. And I'll be like, bye! <laughs> Standing at the bus station. Anyways, I told you that to say this. Love is the, it isn't the robe. Love is the satchel that binds the robe together. And you tie it. I know I said satchel. It's kind of weird. It's like Santa Claus's belt, okay? It's what binds everything together. Love holds us together. That's how important love really is. And so our love needs to be something that we act upon. It should not be dependent on how we feel about the other person. Our feelings will eventually catch up with what we do. And so let's talk about joy. He says, the spirit produces, it's the harvest, it's the outcome, love, right? Self-sacrificial actions that are in the best interest of other people, but also joy. This is gladness. This is delight. It's like bubbling forth like a mountain with a spring that has an eternal source. You just can't get rid of it. And let me tell you something. You can tell who's God's, who has God's spirit by joy. There are some times you're in church, you ever feel like this? It's like it's a funeral, not a celebration. It's like, yeah, we're here. <laughs> there is a certain part of God's spirit that produces joy. It doesn't mean you're happy necessarily when things go wrong. It means you choose to rejoice despite the circumstances. You may not always have a smile on your face, but you can choose gladness and goodness over evil and negativity. Joy is an incredible attribute of the Spirit of God. And there are some people like Kelly, Kelly Collins. I don't know if she's here. She might be away with her boys. She is our front office administrator. Kelly is like one of the most bubbly people you will ever meet in your life. The moment you come in here, she's got a smile on her face. She gets excited over the smallest things, and she just has joy. Does that mean she's happy every single day? No. Does she have up and down days? Yeah. But Kelly is one of the most joyful people that you will ever meet. Call her up this week. She's going to get like 140 phone calls. Be like, hey, Rick told me to call you. She actually might not be here, so it would actually come to me. But I'll talk to you for a little bit. But we should be having joy. You know, when Jesus came on the scene... The Bible says that his life would bring good news of great joy for all people. When you share Jesus with people, it should be good news that causes them to be joyful. And I think a lot of the times that we share the gospel with people, they leave the conversation feeling worse than when they started it. We've missed the objective. The gospel is good news. It's great joy. It's a restart. We get to reset ourselves with God. He forgives us. We get to start all over and spend forever with him. You know, when you think about joy, it is spontaneous. It is radiant. It is a happy response to life. It's bright and clean and pure. Spiritual joy is not dependent upon the circumstances. And let me share this with you. I have been in some really tough circumstances. Death, divorce, disease, suffering, chaos. I mean, the funny jokes that I share with you here on Sunday morning do not even begin to scratch the surface on some of the nightmares in hell that I've had to experience. But through those experiences, I find my spirit reaching out for hope and joy. You know, a couple weeks ago, I really, I had a really bad day. I mean, it was, it was probably one of the worst days that I've had in a long time. And you maybe have felt like this sometimes, but you just get in a state where, man, everything just seems to be going wrong and you just feel terrible about yourself and your circumstances and you're looking down on yourself and you don't think anybody likes you. And I was in a spiritual battle right in that moment. And so my, my, my gears got kicked in and I'm like, all right, I can't stay like this. And so the first thing that I started to do is I started to pray. 
I started just to talk to God. And you don't have to have any supernatural prayer language or anything special. Just prayer is God talk. You're telling God what you think and how you feel. You start there. And so that's what I did. And I knew I'm living in the realm of negativity. And you know what? This is how I knew it. I made a list of 25 things over the course of my life that have absolutely stunk. Who does that? Right? I'm just going to make a list of everything that stinks in my life and everything that's gone wrong. And that's exactly what I was doing. (laughs) I was focusing on the things that were wrong. And so I decided, the second line of defense is I decided that I was going to start thanking God for the things that were in my life. And the people and the things that I had. And I could see the tide began to turn. And I started to feel a little bit better, but the battle wasn't won. And so I grabbed up my kids and I went outside. And you know, I think that's one of the worst parts about Christianity that we misunderstand. Is we think the Bible has all the answers. And yeah, the Bible has a lot of answers. But just by opening up the Bible and reading it, that doesn't necessarily change things all the time. And I'm saying that as a preacher. Sometimes you do have to go out and do other things. And so that's what I did. Prayer wasn't getting the job done, even though it was helping. Thankfulness wasn't getting the job done, even though it was helping. So I thought, let me get out of this bat cave and go get some vitamin D. And so that's what I did. I went outside, and man, getting outside, I just, I started to feel better. And I hung out with my kids, and then you know what I did? I went and I exercised, and I moved my body, and I got out, and I felt so much better at the end of the day. But man, I was stuck in a rut and I identify it and I, and I went through the motions of what I needed to do to get out of it. Well, it starts with love. And then if we are going to be joyful, it is a choice. And there may be some negative people in this room or negative people in your life and they are making the choice to be negative. It's like sitting down and making a list of everything that's gone wrong. That's a choice that I made and I chose different And so when we look at the fruit of the Spirit, love is a choice. Joy is a choice. That doesn't mean we don't have biological issues. That doesn't mean that there isn't something chemically wrong in your brain that you actually do need medicine for. right? That could absolutely be true. That doesn't mean that the things that I've done solve clinical depression. Okay, There are legitimate issues that people struggle with. So I'm not saying that being depressed is solved by Bible reading and prayer and sunlight. That's not what I'm saying at all. But joy ultimately... For a person who is sound of mind and who is a Christian is a choice. We can choose to be joyful. It is gladness. It is delight. When Paul was in prison, do you know what book he wrote when he was in prison? Philippians. And you know what Philippians is centered on? Joy. Can you imagine being in prison, not even having a comfy bathrobe like I had? Relying on other people to bring you food? Being in chains for the gospel of Jesus? And yet you decide to sing and write about joy. How many of you would do that? I can't honestly say that that would be my first inclination, okay? It would have to be a choice. And Paul chose joy. And when he was sitting in prison, he told those who are out of prison, rejoice. Have joy. Be glad. Talk about the things that you're happy about. And that's what I want to do. You know, on the night of Jesus' death, you know what he said to his disciples? Let me read it to you. The night before he died, by crucifixion, this is what he had to say. As the Father has loved me, so I love you. It starts with love. Remain in my love. Be busy doing spiritual things. If I'm busy doing spiritual things, you won't get distracted with sinful things. If you keep my commandments, you will remain in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and remain in his love. And I have told you these things so that my joy may be in you and your joy may be complete. Hey, I'm going to die tomorrow and I want to give you my joy. Think about that. Think about a person on their deathbed suffering and dying from a disease and giving you their joy. You want to tell me joy is not a choice? It is absolutely a choice. Here's Jesus the night before he is going to die. He starts with love. He says, keep my commandments. Be busy with spiritual things and you won't be overcome with sinful things. Instead, you will have joy. I want that kind of joy, don't you? I want to have the joy of God despite my circumstances. Joy is an essential part to the kingdom It is a gift from God that is closely related to our hope. I like what Paul has to say in Romans 15, 13. He says, now may the God of hope fill you with joy and peace as you believe in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Well, why should I be joyful, Rick? Here's what joy does. It pushes you to a better tomorrow. It gives you hope. When you start with love 
and you choose joy, the future looks better. But when you choose not to love and you don't have joy, you can't see nothing but disaster in the future. And it's eventually what causes people to take their own life. There is no hope for the future. There is nothing good about my life. I have nothing worth to live for. And I've got people in my own family who have made that choice and that decision to take their own life because their joy was gone. They didn't feel loved by God and they felt incapable of loving other people. And so they chose to end it. Our spiritual lives are not just at stake here. This overflows into who we are, body, soul, and spirit. We need to choose joy and focus on the things that are good. It's a blessing to focus on joy. I like what Paul said in 1 Thessalonians. He said, in spite of the great suffering, you imitated us in the Lord when you welcomed the message with joy and the Holy Spirit. He says, look, you guys have suffered a lot, but you were acting and living like us and like Jesus when you heard the gospel and you accepted it with great joy. That's what I hope for you every Sunday, to accept the message with great joy, not to walk out of here being like, I'm a loser and I can't ever measure up. That's the worst part, it's good news. You're loved by God. You're forgiven by God. He wants to work through you and in you and you can make a choice to love and to have joy and that can start today. But notice he says, you imitate us in Jesus when you choose joy. You know, joy should be saturated in our lives. Peter said that we should have an inexpressible joy. We should all have joy in our lives. But what happens when we have joy but we're not happy? I mean, think about it. I already mentioned this, Paul. You think he was happy to be in prison? No. You think Jesus was saying, hey, y'all, I'm going to die tomorrow. And he was smiling and be like, this guy is crazy. Right? I mean, imagine smiling and being happy about things that are going wrong. That's not joy. Joy isn't necessarily putting a smile on your face. It's choosing to rejoice despite the circumstances. So I don't want you to be happy about the things that you're going through that stink. I don't want you to think suffering is good. I want you to choose to rejoice in spite of the circumstances. That is true spiritual joy. I already shared with you my personal story about what worked for me, but there are a few other things that actually might work that I didn't do. Here's here's something that you can do to find joy when you know you're not joyful and you know you're going down the wrong path. One of the best things that you can do is reach out to other Christians. Give somebody a phone call. Go spend time with another Christian. If you are just feeling like life stinks, go get encouragement from somebody else. Don't just keep it to yourself. The Bible says in 1 Thessalonians, he says, after all, to the church, who is our hope and our joy, our crown of boasting, if it is not you yourselves in the presence of our Lord Jesus at his coming? You, he says, indeed, are our glory and our joy. Paul says, man, even though life stinks when I think about you, I have something to celebrate. And sometimes you need people in your life who can point to the things that you should celebrate over. Satan wants you to be isolated. He wants you to be cut off from the people and the things around you. He wants you to focus on things that are going wrong, the negative, the sin, the idolatry. And he doesn't want anybody in your life to point to the things that you should celebrate about. Read your Bible, pray, list things that you are thankful for. Get out and get some sunlight for crying out loud. Get some exercise. But if that doesn't work, spend time with other people. And maybe spend time with other people doing those first five things. How about this? Give thanks for your difficult circumstances. Isn't that weird to think about as a Christian? God, I want to thank you for this opportunity that I am suffering for you. Thank you for my job loss. Thank you for the person that passed away that I loved and cared for. Thank you for the opportunity, God, that I could love you and express joy despite my circumstances. That is weird, dude. If this is your first time here in church, it's weird, okay? And I've been a Christian for a long time. It's weird, but try it. Here's what the Bible says. Look at this. In, first, in, in James chapter 1, verse 2, Consider it pure joy, my brothers, when you encounter trials of many kinds. What? That doesn't make sense. It's because it's a love and a joy that surpasses all understanding. Consider it joy when you go through trials. And here's what he says. Because you know that the testing of your faith develops perseverance. Allow perseverance to finish its work so that you may be mature and complete, lacking in anything. Not lacking in anything. Thank God for your difficult situations and your circumstances. I can help you act and choose joy. And I'll end with this scripture. 
Peter says this, rejoice that you share in the sufferings of Christ. Why? So that you may be overjoyed at the revelation of his glory. 